Hello and welcome to the Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Doc Podcast. I'm really excited to have Mr. Ty Ramsey with me as today's guest. Many of you probably already know Ty, but to give you a bit of background on him, he's been in the dental industry since 2004 and became well-known for his skill and knowledge as a sales rep with ICAT, where he sold more than 800 CBCT systems in the U.S. and was named Rep of the Year over 15 times. Ty is widely regarded as one of the most experienced authorities in the United States in regard to CBCT technology and often lectures at dental meetings and study clubs across the country. Approximately a year and a half ago, Ty started Ramsey Consulting, specializing in CBCT consulting, practice transitions, and 3D printing. And now, hot off the press, Ty is a consultant with Professional Transition Strategies, which we're going to talk much more about shortly. On a personal note, Ty is actually the reason why I purchased a CBCT back in 2014, as he promised me it would transform the way I practiced, and he was 110% correct. I actually would not be doing what I'm doing today, teaching and educating colleagues, if it weren't for investing in that CBCT machine almost 10 years ago. Ty is a wealth of knowledge on all things CBCT and someone to whom I've turned many times over the years for advice and guidance regarding 3D imaging and technology. He always answers a call, text, or email, and his passion for taking great care of the doctors with whom he works is unrivaled. We've become friends over the years, and I'm really looking forward to talking to him, not only about all things CBCT related, but also about his new endeavor and new position with professional transition strategies. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ty Ramsey to the show. Welcome, Ty. Thank you very much, Dr. DeLuke. Great to be here and uh, great to connect again, you know, as as we have been connecting throughout all the years, but uh, really flattered with that introduction. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Well, it's, it's all true. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really cool. We've we've known each other, as I said, for about a decade now and uh, gotten to watch each other in our sort of traditional roles we met in and now in a bit a bit different roles uh, that we are now in. It's, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, part of the fun of what we do in this profession isn't just what we do with our patients, but getting to know people like yourself and, and uh, people who I always felt you were a rep who um, wasn't just a rep. As we talked about, you know, in the past, you weren't even my rep. I mean, you, I was in the Northeast, you were down South, but uh, I went to a show, AAO, I believe it was, and, and I uh, got talking with, uh, you and Lou Chmura was there and who's going to be an upcoming guest on the, on the doc podcast. Oh, wow. And you introduced me to him and, and, you know, you just, you just really helped educate me about 3d imaging. Um, I had a lot of questions. I, I, I think you can say probably more, more than maybe the average, uh, although orthodontists were pretty particular on that stuff, but I was, I remember firing a lot of questions at you and at Lou and, uh, um, you just, you never rattled by it. You always kept your composure and, and you let the product speak for itself as far as what it could do for me in my practice. Uh, and it really did. I don't, I honestly don't think I would have taken the leap had you not been there, uh, not only to help educate me as to what it could do for my practice. And it put me in touch with people, uh, colleagues of mine that could also talk about that, but also the support you gave me afterward. Uh, we, we kept in touch uh, probably every six months to a year, we were firing emails or texts and chatting about this stuff. And you're just a wealth of knowledge on it. And I really wanted to have you on to, to help talk to doctors uh, about why CBCT is so valuable, what it can do for them and their practice and their patients. I know what it did for me. You saw the, the other doc podcast I did on cone beam imaging. I have CE courses on, on the doc platform on the website about it. Uh, but sometimes it's different coming from a colleague versus someone who really knows this industry and has known this industry for, for many, many years. So uh, as I said, you're a wealth of knowledge on this topic, and I'm, I'm really excited to have you share that with everybody. Thanks. And I, I, I still remember uh, all the questions and I actually really appreciate it. I mean, it. You know, what told, you know, I would say of, of the thousands of people I've talked to about cone beam, you were probably top top 5% in number of questions, which I appreciate it <laughs> because that just tells me that told me that you're a great orthodontist and you want Thanks. the best for your patients and you were going to 
um, you know, vet this thing to the nth degree. And, and you had a passion for, you know, well, why do I really need this? Why is it really the best for my patients? And that, mm -hmm. you know, and I've got that same passion. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I love telling you about it and why that, you know, what my other practitioners have done, you, you know, have a look at this guy, have a look at this guy, this is what they've done. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we'll both agree. I, you know, I, I remember the, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, when you ever sleep, but if I think you're on <laughs> Eastern time and I'd get the emails at midnight and stuff, and I'd be impressed just by that. Um, but I remember, you know, that one of our more recent conversations, you said, hey, you know, look at some of these incredible cases. Mm -hmm. Look at what I've done. And uh, what, part of what gave me the passion, I, I always felt blessed to represent a product or a tool that enabled medical dental practitioners to improve the lives of their patients. Mm -hmm. And in so many cases, um, you know, I was told even saved the lives of their mm -hmm. patients or extended the lives of their patients because of the tool that they were using, which I represented. So that, it was really an honor to go through, you know, to be, to represent that product. And that's part of what fueled the passion for me. Mm -hmm. um, and in turn, you know, it also helps improve the lives of the doctors and their families. Yep. Uh, and that's why not to jump ahead, but that's why I also love what I'm doing now because that's what I'm doing now is creating financial stability for doctors and their families. That's great. Well, you have a talent for it and you know, you're going to succeed in, in any endeavor uh, and whatever you take on. Um, and again, your accessibility, your knowledge and your honesty, truthfully, your honesty uh, to t say this, this is beyond my scope or this is beyond my comfort zone, but I'm going to put you in touch with somebody who, who can get you that answer. And, and I really respected that. Uh, I, I never felt like you were trying to sell me on something. I, I felt like you were trying to help educate me and give me the appropriate information to make an informed decision that could benefit my patients and my practice. And it, and it did. And we'll talk as we go through the podcast about some stories of that. Um, but I mean, I, I changed so many patients lives by detecting what I was able to detect with 3D imaging. I have, I should say up front, I have no financial interest in any comb beam company and any 3D imaging company. Uh, I'm not paid by anyone to speak for anyone. So uh, I, I, I say this and do this because of my passion for it, because I know what it did for me. And I was always kind of I shouldn't say always first, maybe five, seven years of my career. I wasn't really airway aware. I didn't really understand it. I didn't get much of it, if any, in our residency. Um, and it just 20 years ago, we really didn't talk about it much in orthodontics, even though if you look at the literature, it's, it's been there for, for many decades, but uh, sure. it still tends to not be heavily discussed. But then I started having parents, I mean, the patients and the parents really drove this in me. They started telling me things that were happening when I would go in younger and help develop the arches or, uh, you know, they, they'd say, geez, I saw the ENT and they noticed this. And I was on the cleft cranial facial team at a hospital. So I started talking to the ENTs and actually the cone beams that I was sending to the hospital, to this ENT who ran the pediatric uh, otolaryngology department at this hospital that's the reason they recruited me to be on their team, on their cleft cranial facial team. Yeah, they were blown away by it they, because they didn't have, they didn't, the, 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 the dental practitioners seem to be so far ahead of the medical practitioners yes. on that because the medical practitioners, normally you're talking about getting a head CT at a hundred times the dose. Yep. And, um, with, you know, with some people taking on the um, all cone beam all the time, because doesn't every patient deserve a cone beam? Not, mm -hmm. not my words, theirs, but mm -hmm. um, it, at a low dose, it allows you, it gives you guys more information on every patient. As a matter of fact, I have a very personal experience with that. I walked into my own ENT. I was having allergy problems and this was a guy I've been practicing 30 years and he walked in and, you know, could tell that, you know, I wasn't going to educate him on anything. And I said, Hey, I've got a scan of my, do you want to see it? He goes, ah, yeah. Okay. I'll look at it. And I pull up, I pull it up on my phone and start scrolling through <laughs> and he looks at it and then he has a double take and he's like, wait, can I see that? And uh -huh. I can scroll through this and he's scroll and he's just complete. I mean, it was just a complete light switch moment yep. for him. 
And then he said, all right, I want you to do this, but the, before your next appointment in six weeks, can you get another one of whatever that was to get an <laughs> updated one? I mean, that was from my own ENT. It had been practicing 30 years. That, that's amazing. About what year was that? Uh, that was just like uh, about three years ago. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It was recent, too. It's it's amazing. Yeah, the head surgeon of the uh, cleft cranial facial team, Shu Natateo, who's going to be on a, a guest on the podcast in, in the near future, uh, she came to my office and just showed up. And because she was reviewing a case with Jason Muzakis, who the, was the head ANT, who is also going to be a, a future guest. And uh, they're just amazing, amazing humans, amazing physicians. And he tells the story where he's like, Shun, get in here. You've got to see this. She's like, there's this guy, Deluke and Schenectady that's doing this thing. <laughs> and, and, and so she showed up at my office, which is a good half hour from where she was in the hospital to recruit me to be on their team because they couldn't believe uh, that I was taking these images and understanding them. And I sent it with a full report, as I always did with my referrals, which I teach in my courses how to do that. And it developed these amazing amazing relationships with the ENTs and allergists and myself being a, a, an allergy sufferer. Um, it was great. I mean, I was able to, I had multiple head CTs. I probably had, I've had at least four, uh, two sinus surgeries. And, and, and I think that's where a lot of my passion for this comes in is not just on the ENT side of things, but the allergy side of things, the nasal passageways, understanding mm -hmm the sinuses and what they should look like. And I think what's important for us to get out there is we're not diagnosing this. I'm not diagnosing patients with, uh, you know, turbinate hypertrophy in terms of, I can say that the turbinates are inflamed and there's hypertrophy, but I'm not diagnosing them with allergies because of that. I'm just merely right. diagnosing the symptom, which is no different than diagnosing any of the other myriad of symptoms that orthodontists diagnose each and every single day. So I see that you understand it. And then you send a copy of the CD. Well, it was a CD. Now it's an email. You send it over to them with a link and a nice professional letter that you can email to them. And that same day, they have access to that patient scan with a formal letter from you in your office explaining the findings that you saw. And Ty, the number of patients, both ENT and allergy, you know, ENT is usually a little more clear. It's, you know, and, and I think that's where orthodontists and I have had many say to me, you know, Mike, I can see adenoids and and tonsils without a, a cone beam. You know, and I, I see a smile. And I'm sure you've heard that a time or two. And, and it's like, yeah, okay, uh, fine. But can you see in the nasal passageways? And why are we ignoring that? Because I found so many symptoms of breathing disorders and airway disorders that I sent to the allergist that the allergist was just, they were blown away that I was finding this stuff on these patients. And then all of a sudden you get these kids who are going, the parents are going, that's why they're stuffy all the time or it's that, that, right? It's that light switch moment for everyone. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, I think everyone will agree in medicine in general, there's an, there's an, uh, you know, there's an, somewhat of an epidemic of, of treating the symptom and not the root cause. So true. Um, this helps you get to the root cause in many cases mm -hmm. because um, I really feel like uh, me and a, a pretty small group of cone beam reps um, were really on the forefront of uh, really just with our tool again mm -hmm. that, that we that we sold and put in practitioners' hands. We really changed. Uh, we didn't. The practitioners did with our tool. Changed the way dentistry and orthodontics was practiced. It became. Yes. And it's becoming every day a more collaborative approach. I've yep. got, you know, GPs collaborating with orthodontists, collaborating with ENTs. Mm -hmm. There was, I still remember it's this video is still on YouTube and it's many years old now. It's called Finding Connor Deegan. And it's uh, C O N N O R last name Deegan D E E G A N. Oh, and it's. It it's basically an open letter from a concerned mother to the medical and dental community saying, if I hadn't just by luck stumbled across these collaborative practitioners, hmm. my son would still be in a world of hurt now. And the, and the wow. story is 
he was he was uh, he was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. He mm -hmm. made C's, D's, and F's in in uh, school, and the only thing wrong with him is that he wasn't he had sleep related breathing disorders. And it's yep. a little five minute clip on that. And at the end, she implores all practitioners to come together. Yeah, because you know now we found Connor Deegan. My son was in there the whole time, and we just needed these pra collaborative practitioners to uncover, you know, that you treat the root cause. It's so yeah. profound. I, I, I will immediately after the after this go look at that because I, uh, and on my website I have a testimonial section, and multiple of those are parents telling that exact same story. I had parents, moms and dads break down in tears sometimes um all the time like I, literally I, in in front yeah. of me whether it be just when i figured it out diagnostically and said you know is johnny tell me about how he sleeps you know is he restless sleeper and all the questions that you go through with this and uh i know a lot of people do airway questionnaires i kind of have like a format formatted template i had certain questions in my medical history but i always liked to ask them i had a, a list of about eight questions or so that i would feed in if if i saw it if the airway looked great and there were no issues obviously you don't need to go there but i would like to ask those questions in person in my consultation and watch the reaction and watch how they responded when i took them on a tour of the airway which is something that i i developed a, a real great protocol for how to just quickly take the patient and the parent on this airway tour i would call it and i would pretend that the, the little cursor was air and i'd be like here we are this is air we're going in through the nose and anywhere you can see dark means that air can go and anywhere you can see gray or white means it can't and i would just take them on this simplified tour and they get it and then when you go and you're like they're like wait 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 there's no dark there can the air go and you're like no <laughs> and then you start to say do you notice these symptoms the, the 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 school performance i had a dad tell me a stat sort of burly guy not the guy you would expect we're in the clinic he's sitting there across from the patient and he literally is it was actually a cleft craniofacial case fascinating case dad literally teared up and said he has gone up three reading levels this year after you figured out what you figured out worked with dr muzakis and got his arches developed. And, and I mean, it's powerful. And again, I have no personal financial interest in any exactly. of this. I exactly. just saw what it did for me and my patients and my practice. And I've you often have a, said- You have I, a personal interest in humanity. Yes. Now, that's, I mean, and, it, and that's why, again, I feel so blessed just to have represented a tool that helped practitioners improve lives. I mean, I had many practitioners tear up to me telling stories. <laughs> Yeah, it's powerful. Uh, it, uh, it is so powerful. And I'll I'll never, you know, one of uh, my closest friends that, uh, you know, I've become close friends with, with many practitioners that, uh, you know, I have a customer for life philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I'll always talk to you when you want to call me, you know, and anything like, you know, that. Which I, yeah, uh, I can attest to personally, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. One of my uh, uh, closest friends, you know, just through business and now, uh, you know, uh, honored to call him a friend, um, Stuart Frost at the uh, um, at, a, at a very large forum um, that he lectures at told the story. Uh, there's an incredible story uh, that made national news. It was five or six years ago. He has an identical twin brother. He's an orthodontist. His twin brother's an endodontist. An incredible story. Uh, a mom lost her child at the beach and he had uh, gotten uh, underneath the sand and it collapsed on him and they Ooh. found the child dug him up he was technically dead when they found him and him and his brother did cpr on him and brought the kid back from death wow uh, you know back you know brought him back to life forever and um, he told that powerful story, and of course, he was tearing up. He st he, he still they they visit with the family. They wow. go and meet once a year. But after he said that, I'll never forget. He said, you know, and but uh, there's there's no feeling in the world like saving a life. Mm -hmm. um, and now, uh, because I have my CBCT, I feel like I get to do that every day at work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just an incredible story. Yeah, the stories are just, they're so powerful. And I, I say often uh, to, to people, I would say in conversation, now I say it in my teaching capacity, 
I changed a lot of lives and I'm really proud of a lot of the smiles I created and, and, and throughout my career, almost 20 years clinically, nothing compares to the feeling of a phase one case where you diagnose what's going on with this patient, make the appropriate referral to your ENT and or allergy colleagues, develop their arches, make room for the tongue, help make space for those teeth, yeah. make the kid look better, which again, why our profession is so against making eight and nine year olds look better. It absolutely boggles my mind. Okay. Um, it, 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 looking it, for a picture as you talk to show you real quick, but yeah, continue. Yeah. yeah it, it's like, you know, okay. It's okay to make them look better at 11, but at eight, it's just, it's insane. But uh, I can go on and on about that side of things. But when you, when you see the reaction of these families and the patients and the parents, and again, I've got a lot of these video testimonials on my website, theorthocoach.com. It is amazing. And it, it gets to you at your core and you really have, we all love, we all go into this, yourself included, because we want to help, right? You wanted to help yeah. doctors. You wanted to help patients yeah. through doctors. I went into this profession because I wanted to change people's lives. I wanted to have a positive impact on the lives of people and their self-esteem. I never imagined I would actually be able to help them as you know, we were just talking about potentially save a life by getting these and, and, and at the very least improve their quality of life for years on. Um, the other thing I'll mention on that is because with the low dose protocol, which I want to talk about in a moment, sure. I want to talk more about those radiation levels because that seems to be such a, a, a hot button topic with this and yeah. so much misinformation and disinformation out there about it. But when that's what really convinced me because I was very concerned. Uh, I think you can attest to that. Oh, yes. Yeah, very very concerned. And my other and, biggest. And rightly so, because um, I call it the. Uh, uh, there's actually, um, there's actually, and I'm still, I'm still looking for that picture, but okay. well, it, uh, the picture I was looking for is, um, Stuart Frost was treating a nurse, um, okay. and, and she had a down syndrome. Um, uh, her pay, her son had down syndrome. He was okay. about three years old and Stuart knew that he wasn't breathing correctly. And they mm -hmm. didn't really went out of the box. They did a palatal expander on him. Mm -hmm. Um, they have a whole video of like, you know, them holding his hand and, you know, trying to get him through the tree. You know, it was, it was, it was a, it was a real booger putting on the, the, you know, the, the appliance, mm -hmm. but, um, I've got a side by side somewhere that I'll, uh, show you. I won't disrupt any longer cause I can't find it, but the kid, it looked, he looks like a different kid. I'll tell you, if you uh, want to just send it to me after Ty, I'll put it up in the, for those watching on video, I'll actually put it as an overlay. Uh, as you're talking, I'll just kind of set yeah. the picture up so people can see it. So yeah, just yeah. send it to me after and I'll put it up. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And that's, and we'll get, obviously we'll get his permission. Sure. To do yep. That. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm, now I'm back. Okay. That's great. No, that, and, and that's the, the message needs to get out there. And I love stories like that. And, um, we need to think outside the box, you know, full open disclosure. I applied to speak at the 2024 AAO mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got back my rejection letter and they told me I scored very well in terms of my abstract and my objectives and credentials and everything, but that my topic lacked in, uh, there wasn't sufficient interest in this. Um, it was going to be pediatric sleep disorder, breathing and interceptive treatment. Yeah. And it wasn't uh, relevant. It lacked in relevance and interest is, is what I was told by the AAO. And I tell that story, not yeah. to bash AAO. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's, it's because I really feel if we don't get the jump on this as a profession, when I lecture on this at study clubs and I'll give regional, local and regional study club lectures, uh, and there'll be dentists of all specialties and non-specialists in that room. And it's very interesting. The general dentist and the pediatric dentists are like all on board with this. They get it. I show the images. They're 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 just fascinated by it. They they come up to me afterwards with questions. They ask questions in the question and answer period. I'm not being critical of my orthodontic colleagues and saying this. I'm just stating a fact. The orthodontists don't even want to talk to me about it afterwards. They they kind of run out of the room, you know. And I'm not saying a hundred percent, but the percentage of you know the GPs and pedos who are like, I want to know more about this. Why aren't more orthos doing this? And then the orthodontists on this side who just they don't even want to discuss it. And yeah. I don't understand it. Um, I, I I will keep fighting this fight. Again, I don't have any personal stake in this to uh -huh. advance this other than I know this is the right thing. And I'm passionate about orthodontics and I don't want to see the orthodontists miss an opportunity where I really feel if we keep 
ignoring this and saying it's not relevant. Uh, and the AAO keeps ignoring what can be done with CBCT, low dose on younger kids and getting in there younger to help develop these arches and capacity to breathe better. If we keep ignoring that, the pedos and the GPs are going to eat our lunch and they're going to start to figure out that they can do this. And then when you are. Are. it's all about, um, you know, the pushback is the naysayers always say, well, you know, it, this is just anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. There's no yes. empirical <laughs> evidence. Yep. But then again, I have all these practitioners that have treated, um, you know, a hundred people in a certain way and had it be a positive effect 99 or a hundred times. Yep. Is that still anecdotal evidence? I guess if you're going by the, you know, statistics and whatnot, but you know, is it really, I mean, yep. that's, that was always the argument. People are, Hey, every patient that I've treated this way, you know, and then the naysayer, oh, well, we need more studies. We need more studies. Yep. We need more studies. So, you know, it's just a constant battle. I don't agree, disagree with any of them. That's not my place to tell anyone how to practice. It's just, I uh, felt it was my place to give them the proper information and help them get in the mindset to accept um, what a cone beam could potentially do for them yes. and their patients. Absolutely. Uh, on that, why don't we take a moment to talk a little bit about the radiation, uh, kind of the elephant in the room here. Uh, and and I am amazed. I'll just start by saying, and then I want to turn to you to to kind of get some more detailed information from your perspective. I'm amazed every time I post about something on Combeam in one of the online study groups, or we'll talk about it. Constantly, people are saying you're 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 harming your patient, you know, Alara principles, you're not using them. And it actually, it amazes me because I'll then provide to them the data mm -hmm. the, that show that a lower dose protocol, you can get a very good image. I mean, I basically only use the low dose protocol on every single patient as their initial screening image. I only took more in-depth, uh, higher radiation scans if it was say a cleft craniofacial patient or a trauma patient or something out of the ordinary. But I use that initial protocol. Let, you could debate over the maybe exact microsieverts based on the image size field of view, but let's just call it 15 to 20 microsieverts, right? I think if you're okay with that, like we can kind of go with that sort of range yeah, it, yeah, for a low dose. Yeah, it depends dose. On, the, on the manufacturer, but I mean, even all of the cone beam, but you know, there are specific ones that have uh, ultra low dose options and then other ones that just have, you know, normal dose options. But com if you're going to compare it to a head CT, yeah, it's just a blip on the radar screen. And there's a study, it was from antmini.com in which a, uh, they had like 60,000 patients in a, in a six month or a year study in which they, uh, they were, they were practicing Alara and they said, Oh, here are our findings. And their average head CT was 2.4 millisieverts on adults and kids. Mm -hmm. And that's 2,400 microsieverts. Mm -hmm. Do you think, Ty, for a moment, if I can interrupt you, do you think that's where the confusion is in the units comes in? Like people see 2.4 and then they say that a head CT, millisieverts, I know we're not talking micro, but they see 2.4 reported. Because I notice a lot of times in the medical literature, they do report millisieverts, not microsieverts. And then in the orthodontic side of it with a cone beam, it's microsieverts. Do people have a hard time understanding. And when they see, say, 20 microsieverts, think that it's almost 10 times more than the medical CT? Do you think? I think so. I mean, that's that's how dentistry gets a bad rap. I mean, you guys are giving a, a, such micro doses of, yes. uh, of radiation compared to compared to the to the MDs, which, by the way, the amounts that they're giving out too has been deemed you know, safe <laughs> by the FDA. So yeah. yeah, all their stuff's measured in millisieverts, which right. there are a thousand millisieverts in one microsievert. So yep. if I'm a five-year-old kid and I'm on the jungle gym and bump my head, get rushed to the hospital, head CT, 2,500 microsieverts. Mm -hmm. 
if I'm a kid who has sleep re related breathing disorders and um, I go to Dr. Duluth to get a consult, I'm going to get the ultra low dose scan that can be as low as uh, 11 microsieverts or mm -hmm. call it on a small child, um, call it 17 and a half or 18 microsieverts. Mm -hmm. But because uh, it's a little hot because uh, the, the small children's pituitary glands are a little more susceptible uh, to radiation. Now, I'm just parroting um, uh, the John W. Ludlow study mm -hmm. in which he, he, uh, he did a, a study on um, a number of different machines. He's retired now, but at the time he was known as the godfather of radiation mm -hmm. studies. And, he went so far as to test a child phantom on uh, one on a on you know on a specific machine, and uh, the dose was eleven microsieverts on an adult and seventeen and a half or eighteen microsieverts on uh, on a child. To put that in perspective, referencing other studies here, um, you get about eight microsieverts a day just w walking around. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in Colorado, Arizona, someplace like that, you might get 10 or 11. But the average, you absorb eight microsieverts a day just by walking around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and I mean, a chest CT, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, you're talking, what, 7,000 a lot of times microsieverts? Yeah, it, something like that. I don't remember the exact, but pretty yeah. high. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, so comparatively, <laughs> it makes... It's and, infinitesimal. And, I mean, it's... it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Alara is an acronym for, as uh, you know, everyone that probably knows watching this podcast is as low as reasonably achievable, and it just gets left off there. Um, there's a second part that says consistent with obtaining the required data to for your diagnosis. There you go. So, Very important. Yep. So that second part, you can you can just, I mean. You tell me you're the practitioner. Uh, again, I'm not here to tell people how to practice, but it seems log logical to me that you can justify then taking a cone beam on every patient mm -hmm. because you're getting exponentially more information on every patient. You're getting an entire encyclopedia of information, which you can turn to any page at that encyclopedia at any time. Uh, the TMJ page, the impaction page, the airway page, the transverse dimension page. Mm -hmm. And with a PAN or a CEPH, you've got two pages. And those pages are, uh, you know, there are multiple studies out there that reference, uh, you know, PANs have a, a 24, 25% error rate. And mm -hmm. in some studies, there's a, a study, a few studies out there um, that treatment plans have changed when the doctor had 2D data versus 3D data. Absolutely. Up to 44% of the time. And that's mm -hmm. no small number. I know it did for me. I know it did for me. Um, interesting too, if we're talking about a lot of principles, and I've said this to colleagues, if you're using a film-based pan, and Seth, which there are still people doing it, you can't even be in this game of a conversation because the radiation doses are probably th three, four times higher than what you're getting with, with a, a low dose protocol cone beam. If you're using a, a digital pan, Seth, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, your digital pan is going to be 20, 25 microsieverts. Your digital Seth is going to be five to 10, depending on again, child size. And uh, am I correct on, on those? Yes. And if you're in not every machine out there, but there are certain cone beams that you can take um, a 3D protocol all the way through um, pre-treatment, mid-treatment, progress scan, um, and, and then post-treatment mm -hmm. and be at a lower combined dose than a full 2D protocol. Without a doubt. Things do exist. Yes. Yep, without a doubt. And the so they'll argue about it. And I, I, this kind of transition, there's so many tentacles to this. And just to kind of consolidate it for brevity, I think it comes down to, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this. One is cost, right? It's kind of, kind of people want to talk about like, these things cost more. They do, right? Probably about three times as much as a, as a 2D image or pan Ceph machine. The second one I see a lot of times is fear of liability. Uh, I think, and again, we can go into each one of these a little bit, but but 
the, the, the cost one lack of ROI, you can't bill for it necessarily to bill for, to make up for the cost of it. The responsibility and sort of the liability, the responsibility to diagnose, I'll just say personally what I did. And you and I talked about this because these are all questions I asked you in the, in the, in the many questions I asked you a decade ago. Um, when I saw something, I treated it just like a 2D image. When I saw something that I didn't understand or didn't know what it was, I made the appropriate referral. I actually went back and looked, and I have this in the in the podcast online, and I, I, exact numbers escaping me, but I think it was like five or six, less than 10, I'm almost positive, images I sent in my career using comb beam from 2014 to a oral maxillofacial radiologist. There were times it happened. I didn't. I saw a sinus that was more enlarged than I liked, or or there was just a lack of continuity in a certain part of the airway, and I didn't really trust it. So, or you see an opacity in an area where there's not supposed to be an opacity. But the point is, is the fear of liability. I never had a problem ever with it. And actually, patients are the opposite. They appreciate that you're looking at more information and more data, and it has getting into. The first point we made, which was the cost, it has a tremendous indirect ROI, meaning can you bill more for a cone beam? Well, I guess you could, but a lot of orthodontists don't bill for their records anyway. I always did. We, we included in the treatment, added as an add-on in the treatment fee, um, but an itemized add-on. We you know, sh show the patients the, bill, the, the fee they were paying for that. But whether you bill for it or not, my practice grew so much after I had a cone beam and understood how to use it. I want to put that caveat out there and just putting this thing in is, you know, like putting the Ferrari in the garage and not understanding how to drive it. You've got to understand how to use this machine and, and educate patients and educate parents as to what they're actually, what you're looking at and what you're diagnosing. But patients, I became known in my community as having more medical knowledge as being the one to go to the expert to go to in certain situations, because I took the time to look at these images um, and others weren't either. They had the machine and they weren't looking at the images in the detail. I was and understanding airway and what they really were looking at, uh, or they didn't have the machine and the indirect ROI is, is exponential. And I think, again, we get so fearful of change. And, and I think the third, I would say, is fear of change. And it's a new machine. You have to have train your staff differently, new protocols. You need data storage, right? These images are fairly large. So you have to have, maybe you would be forced to upgrade your servers, new backups on and off site. So I think the end of it is, it's a lot of excuses. I think it's a lot of excuses for reasons why they don't want to feel badly that they're not offering this. Um, again, my take on it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, and it's it, it's changed over the years. When I got you know in the, mm -hmm. in the mid two thousands and selling comb, mid to late two thousands, um, you know, selling comb being the uh, the conversation always started off of, um, well, how good of a pan and a Seth can I get out of this machine? I mean, that was always it. Oh, I'm <laughs> interested. Yep. That that was it. And now, you know, you fast forward to today, um, it's the conversations completely changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I, and I would say the majority of practitioners don't fear cone beam anymore, but it took a long time to get there. And just exact, I agree with a hundred percent of what you said in, in your pod in, in your podcast on cone beam, um, it's, it's the liability, uh, that they, you know, people are, are scared of the liability uh, of the dose and the cost. Those are, you know, in the fear of change, but mm -hmm. the liability dose and cost were the three main objections that I got. And I, I'll say this much about liability. Again, I'm not telling anyone how to practice. I'm just parroting what I've heard from, uh, been through hundreds of lectures in which lawyers lectured. And um, uh, there, there's a, 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 I would joke with practitioners, I say, do you know this guy? And when they say no, I'd say, it's good you don't because he's one of the top malpractice attorneys <laughs> in the nation. So it's good you don't know him. Um, but he claims that, you know, he, he won't defend anyone anymore at, at, on any kind of malpractice claim because what are you looking for? You're looking for negligence. And, mm -hmm. and if they don't have a cone beam, how do you prove negligence? 
did you use doctor did you use all the technology available to you readily available to you today in the dental community mm -hmm. um and if the if if the answer's well i it just took a standard pan and ceph or bite wing whatever 2d but 3d protocol is available and if treatment plan would have changed from mm. that 3D protocol i mean just use logic if you're in the jury there you know right. like well, i would use the example uh uh you know with dentists place placing implants you know you show your your pan and here's the nerve and here's the <laughs> implant it looks good right. but it's because right. of the vertical and horizontal magnification issues then you have and then you know when you when, when you put that in 3d it's really like that yep. you know you have a, a subject matter expert that's taking a cone beam on the patient showing the uh, uh the implant going right in the middle of the nerve there yep. so uh the liability thing can really be um you know in my mind put it this way if i was a practitioner i wouldn't practice without a cone beam sp uh, for many reasons but one of them for liability reasons I, um, I completely agree. Uh, I, did they ever say, I'd be curious to know, have there been any documented reports of orthodontists specifically who were sued or found guilty of malpractice because they'd be sued for anything, but found guilty of negligence who had a cone beam and misdiagnosed a patient that it wasn't just something that was, you know, just blatantly missed because they didn't look at the image. That's the other thing. I mean, it's your responsibility. You've got to look at these images, which may be a, another sort of subcategory of why people don't do it because it's real quick and easy to just, you know, look at the pan, the old school style or have it on the computer screen, pan and Ceph, great intercisal angle. This is the, you know, sort of the overall vertical growth pattern real quick. It takes more practitioner time, especially when you're new at this. It's probably about, I'd say it probably took me about a six month learning curve to really get comfortable looking at these quickly on the fly, get a very thorough diagnosis. So if, assuming the doctor is well-educated in the machine and the technology and is looking through it thoroughly, are there cases on the record? Did this guy ever say where that doctor was held accountable for something? Um, I can't say that in at least my experience, all of my, you know, over 800 customer uh, customers, I have never uh, personally had one of my guys at least make known to me or heard about it that had had, had been sued mm. um, in that regard. Um, there was a judge that lectured for us, a judge which used to, he was also an orthodontist and he was a trial judge and he had uh, examples of six cases that he pointed out in which orthodontists were sued um and he believed um if they had taken all without a cone beam if they he with six cases in which he flat out stated i believe as a judge and an orthodontist that if this uh if a cone beam had been taken um then they could have avoided these lawsuits wow. so um uh, i'm of the opinion that uh, just my opinion again not telling people how to practice but uh like i said if if I, if I was a practitioner i would owe to cone beam specifically for the reason among many of, of reducing my liability it's yes that's because, it's, it, because you always want to to show that you've done everything in your power to give the best treatment possible Right. And what a better way to show that than have a 3D on the patient. And, and the thing I think, too, it's not I don't mean to minimize it because, you know, you have to be educated on the anatomy, but it's not rocket science to diagnose the head and neck area on a cone beam. I mean, it's all in where we are the specialists as orthodontists in craniofacial growth and development and anatomy. Right. We know that area like the back of our hand. And if there's a part of that area that you don't recognize or looks abnormal, I mean, we look at so many images of patients. If you look at an area that doesn't look right, make the referral accordingly or send it to oral and maxillofacial radiology or oral surgery or whatever the case might be, just as you normally would. So, yeah, I think I think a lot of it, again, I, I try to be blunt and um, because I have no direct dog in this fight other than wanting to get patients the best care possible. I think a lot of it is excuses uh, and, and people just wanting to rationalize. And it's human nature. Again, I'm not indicting anybody. I'm not being critical of anybody. I'm just calling it as I see it, that I think it's just excuses uh, to kind of make themselves feel better about why they're not doing it. And, and 
that's okay if they want to do it. I mean, honestly, to each their own. And I mean that if you want to practice with 2D film based, you know, if you want to take an FMS on your patients uh, with film, because that's what you feel is best, who am I to tell you that you shouldn't practice that way? At the same time, I think the hard part is, and I'm sure you found this way more than I deal with, dealt with, but um, it's when they're trying to change the opinion of their colleagues to mislead their colleagues that this machine does or doesn't do something. Um, and it's incorrect and false, uh, like such as increased liability exposure. Again, where are the data on that, right? Um, that you're over radiating patients. Where are the data on that if you're using a low dose protocol? You know, they'll make these statements and try to scare other colleagues. And that's where I, that's why I, my mission is to get out there and educate, help people understand what's really going on. Last story I'll tell about that. Um, when I first had my unit inspected, I think I told you this the first time we going back a ways. Uh, I had my unit inspected. The inspector came out, this guy, John Dapolito. Anybody who's listening to this in the upstate New York area knows John. He's been doing it for ever. I mean, he had to be in his 80s. He'd come in with his wife. They were the cutest old couple. They would come in and I mean, just the, just the sweetest people. He's in there and he goes, he's very methodical. You know, everything is, is very methodical. And he was inspecting the unit. And he come, one of my assistants comes to get me and they're like, Dr. Mike, they're like, there's a problem. And I'm thinking, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I just bought this, this machine and there's a problem. He's like, doc, something's not reading. I'm not getting a radiation reading. He had never inspected one. Again, he, because I was in upstate New York at that time, I was one of the first to put, I think I was the first to put uh, a low radiation, um, low dose unit in. It was the ICAT Flex that I was using and no one had one. So he had never inspected one. And so he's doing his normal readings. It's not even at the lowest dose possible. He's not even getting a reading to register. So he starts to think there's something wrong with the machine. So I actually yeah. went in knowing, you know, what you had taught me and my research on it. And I helped educate him and explain the different settings and he could, you know, adjust it to go. Uh, and then so he was able to make the adjustments to get it. And he was blown away. And he said to me, why aren't other people using these? And I said, well, it's, you know, newer technology at that point. It was it's going back almost 10 it. years, but it it's was just, uh, it, you're right. And I, it never left me that moment. I, like I can vividly remember because I was, I mean, you're, you're talking about your, your stomach drops. You're like, wait, no, uh -huh. this, I, there's, don't tell me something's wrong with this machine. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was, it's funny, but that, that, you know, official from a, from a, a radiology inspector, um, yeah. who was by the book, uh, that, that uh -huh. he couldn't even get a reading at its lowest dose because it, uh -huh. his, his, his material, his equipment wasn't sensitive enough to get that low dose even to show up. So, sure. um, yeah, so. But well, I appreciate you taking the time to to chat about that. I hope that the colleagues who are listening to this will find that um, at least informational. And 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 I, I like challenging people um, to be better all the time. I, I like to be challenged, and and I think that uh, our colleagues need to be challenged to uh, accept this and understand that it will it will benefit their patients and change patients' lives. So uh, thank yeah, you for the fight you've put up for this over the years. Oh, you bet. Yeah. And, you know, just from a return on investment perspective, um, the way I would explain it, um, I would say, Doc, when you go out and you, you, you mortgage, you know, you got a mortgage, let's say, you know, you got a million dollar house. You don't look at it like I'm writing a check for a million dollars. And I would joke. And if you are, then this is just a drop in the bucket. We're talking about <laughs> right. you're just writing a check. But if you're looking at it from an ROI perspective, uh, you know, what do you do when you on your mortgage? You know, you look at, oh, what's what, how much is going to save me in taxes? What's my monthly investment? And I would always call it a monthly investment instead of a payment, because it is an investment. It's an investment in you, your patients. When you make an investment, you mm -hmm. expect to get a return on that investment. Mm -hmm. And the return, I mean, it, it kind of segues to what I'm doing now. I'm really working with uh, really larger practices, um, orthodontists, uh, oral surgeons, periodontists, pediatric dentists, GPs. But the majority of these larger practices I'm working practices I'm working with. Well, a lot of them were, are my former clients. Mm. And I've had a front row seat to uh, having this conversation with them about uh, return on investment. And, um, you know, hey, doc, this is 
This is half a case start a month, you know, if you look mm -hmm. at it from that. And I, I, you know, judging from what other people have done with it, I can tell you it's going to increase your case starts by way more than half a case start a month. And, and I can show you ways to market it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of a sudden Smith Orthodontics becomes Smith 3D Orthodontics. Mm -hmm. People you know, that can create interest. There's all kinds of different ways to market this. But nowadays, um, the, you know, the investment on all cone beams has come, you know, kind of like uh, kind of similar to, to TVs. You know, when the when the when the HD TVs came out, very expensive. Then went then 4K came out. Mm -hmm. Now you get a, you know, I was in Walmart the other day, 75 inch 4K TV for 570. <laughs> <laughs> you That's know, crazy. now it's just like that. So it's yeah. not quite to that extreme. I mean, you're still looking for, you know, at a cone beam that can take a a, a full field of view and a single scan, like an orthodontist. Uh, would most likely need um, uh, if they wanted to take a deep dive into airway and everything else. You know, you're still looking at anywhere probably in the seventy to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar range, depending. Mm -hmm. You know, so it is still an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, most of the practices I'm working with now, um, in which I'm, I'm partnering them with clinically agnostic. DSOs or taking them direct to private equity groups that want to invest in them. Um, the majority of those practices have had a cone beam in place for years Interesting. and have, have grown because of it. Not all, but the majority. And, you know, think of it, uh, the reluctance to change. Uh, I can understand being on on their side, think of you know, think you're a very successful orthodontist. Maybe you've been practicing for 20 years. Mm -hmm. You've got a playbook for all your assistants. Mm -hmm. You know, you do this on a class two div two. We mm -hmm. do this when I'm not here. The pan, the Ceph, we do it. Everything is just boom, boom, boom. You can do it in your sleep. You know, from from their perspective, ah, why change? Everything's yes. working. My business is still going up. Yes. Uh, why change? So I can understand why a lot a lot of them don't change. Um, yep. I, 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 you know, everything in my life's going great. My patients love me. So, you know, that that's the reasoning that some people don't change. But yeah. it, 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 it is a paradigm shift. It is a paradigm shift. And I find that, again, like I said before, if they are just hard and fast, I don't want to do this. Okay. Again, who are you or who are you and I to say you have to practice a different way? But where I get so frustrated is watching them then throw shade on the product, on those who are using it, and try to make those who are using it look like we're doing something wrong. And mm -hmm. that's the part that really frustrates me with co with colleagues when they'll do that, um, make it like we're over radiating patients and we're you know, going beyond our scope of practice and all of these things. And I think a lot of it is it's a cover for their own insecurities about it. I think, too, and actually this would be interesting to, to ask you this. I've never asked you this. There were some practices in the area I used to practice at multiple locations. And I think those practices were more against this because the thought of not only the change and implementing all those systems across three, four different physical offices, because they might have a satellite here and that their main office, to, but to buy four of these machines and then train everybody and then have the data storage. I think that becomes a barrier to a lot of these practices as well. Have, did you ever see that or would you agree? It's just my totally my thought, but something I've thought yeah, about. Yeah, I you know I would joke about that up front. I you know they'd say what well, well Ty, you know they'd say Ty what, what what's bad about this machine? I said there is one bad thing kind of jokingly I'd say you get addicted to it. You yeah. got three practices now. I know you're investing in one now. You're going to end up having three. Yep. Sure enough next year is like ty uh you were wrong no you <laughs> right. i need another one <laughs> i need another one because yep. you can't practice that they would say i can't practice without it you were yep. right and one thing that i wanted to talk to you about too while we're talking about people's apprehensions with implementing this technology uh, as you know it it opened my eyes to airway and we've talked about that when one thing that i it I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask you. I find people say to me all the time, like, well, the head posture, you can't determine airway and the volumetric measurement. It's interesting. 
I felt like you never really pushed the volumetric measurement as the biggest thing. And I never, re you know, I read the data, read the studies, and I understand, obviously, if your head is like this or this, you're going to have a different volumetric analysis of the pharyngeal airway. Um, now, a, a separate note, which we're not going to get into is, are they like this because they can't breathe properly? So is that why pre, because I could show you how many scans where pre the patients like this and posts are nice and upright. And we certainly didn't tell the kids look up for the initial image and look straight ahead for the second image. So we could have that debate as well, that that fact that it's restricted initially uh, is because of trying to, you know, literally the CPR posture, the head tilt to get air in. But take that out of it, right? Let's let's just say, yes, if you have a different head posture, it is a static image. It's not dynamic. And I understand it is not the gold standard for airway evaluation and analysis that needs to be done in a sleep lab. Understood. No argument. My point is, is you see so much more than you would see in a 2D image that you can see obstructions that are over. You can see, and as you look at more and more of these over time, you get a real feel for how much patency should be in the nasal passageways. What size turbinates are normal and not normal? Uh, what sort of oropharyngeal space is appropriate? Or is that tongue positioned posteriorly? You can see the tongue position in the oral cavity. Is it posterior and low? Is it high and forward? Where is it relative to uh, the teeth? That is all such important diagnostic information. And I think we get so caught up in showing this volumetric analysis change, which isn't irrelevant, but it's not the key to evaluating and diagnosing the issues that could be happening with an airway. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's cone beam is incredibly accurate at measuring uh, the airway at that point in time that the scan was taken. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, airway, it's fluid. Like you said, it's soft tissue. It, it, you move your head. It can, you know, it can go like this. Like it, it's, ba but at that point in time, it was very accurate and, you know, down to fractions of a millimeter, a cubic centimeter mm -hmm. in measuring that whole space. Uh, but because the patient is not in that paralytic state of sleep in a supine position, um, it's not an accurate barometer for, you know, I, and I would also segue into say, you know, dentists and orthodontists can't diagnose sleep apnea or Correct. sleep related breathing disorders, but they can sure treat it mm -hmm. and collaborate. So, yes, but I always said it's up for you, the practitioner, to use this in whatever way you see fit, but there, there, there did seem to be, uh, many of my practitioners told me that they're pre and post treatment. Um, and they would develop general protocols where they tried to have the head position, yep, the, same. the tongue and the, you know, feel like you're mm -hmm. uh, just comfortably biting down on your back teeth. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't posture and affect their airway. So, you know, they try to maintain a kind of protocol in which, you know, it would be fairly consistent. And there are a number of practitioners out there that, you know, show you a, a pre-treatment and a post-treatment on, you know, majority of the of the children, at least in the scan, you know, the airway appears to be much larger pre and post. I mean, Without a doubt. Yeah. 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 Uh, so my answer to that is you shouldn't rely on the cone beam um, for, you know, for airway. It, it, it can be useful, but it's a fluid. It's not it's static, like you said. So, you know, that's my view on airway. But like you said, you can absolutely it, it, what you can see is when, you know, those the, the turbinates and adenoids are obstructing the airway. Mm -hmm. That's what you can see. Correct. Hey, that's pretty important. Yep. Yep. It, it's so well said. And, and I always say, I'm not diagnosing sleep apnea one, period one at all, you know, full stop. I'm not diagnosing sleep apnea. And then secondarily, I'm not using my cone beam to diagnose them with an airway issue. What I'm doing is I'm looking for specific indicators that are proven scientifically to indicate obstruction to airflow through nasal 
respiration and lead to mouth breathing. And once you become more clinically astute to what you're looking for with this, then you ask the patient and or parent the appropriate follow-up questions. And if you see certain things on a cone beam and you start asking them about mouth breathing and snoring and sleep disordered breathing of the sort that they're loud breathers. And you, you know, it doesn't take long to start asking these questions to realize from the parent and or patient if you're on the right track or not. So you might see certain indicators in a radiograph or in a, in a cone beam, ask some questions and mom's like, nope, good sleeper. Nope, no issues. Nope, not, you know, and, and nope, no problems, not a restless sleeper, not falling asleep in school or not getting reports of hyperactivity, you know, all those key questions. Oh, great. Okay. We move on. They just maybe have different anatomy. And, and it's... Yeah. I had a, I had a, a, a good friend of mine who had, she had a, a four or five year old, she had three boys and, uh, and the, the youngest one was just a terror compared to the other two. Mm-hmm. And I saw a picture of them at the Rangers game and all three of them side by side. And, um, I saw the the young and and I you know I, I in no way am I a practitioner, but I've been to all these lectures where it says here's the here's the symptoms. You know, he had forward head posture, allergic shiners, and mm-hmm. and actually I didn't even know he had been you know a terror you know misbehaving. But I said, does your young do you have any behavioral problems with any of your kids? And she said, oh my gosh, the youngest, we don't know what to do. Huh. And I go to an ENT and look at getting his tonsils and adenoids removed. You might see what the practitioner said, you know, and a few months goes by and she goes, Oh my gosh, I just wanted to thank you. I took your advice. We got tonsils and adenoids removed and he's a different kid. You changed his life. And those words Ty. he's a different kid or she is a different kid. Different kid. Yeah. He heard it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I so many, so often that would be the exact words. They're, they're different. They're a different kid. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, you change the patient's life and, and that's what it's about. And I think that's a great way to kind of encapsulate, uh, the encapsulate and finish up the discussion on the power of this is when you know what you're looking for, you're using cone beam to help add more tools to your tool shed of diagnostic capabilities and try with the goal of figuring out the best treatment for this patient period. And I will contend against anybody that I saw way more and know way more and was a far better practitioner post cone beam installation and use versus pre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it's, that's what it's all about. It's, you know, and when someone used to ask, you know, ask me what I do for a living, you know, if you really drill down, like, I like to do this in my lectures, I like to, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a salesperson for it. No, what do you do for a living? You know, what do you really do for a living? Mm-hmm. When I, when I did that with, when I was doing cone beam, what did I really do for a living? I, I improved people's lives. I improved the lives yep. of practitioners. That's yep. what I, yeah, I did it with a tool that I put in their hands, but the end result was, you know, not the ingredients in the shampoo, but the clean hair. Yep. But yep. Like shampoo analogies, as you say. <laughs> yep. That's great. No, and, and, and you do, and you do and did. So on that, if you could just give a little summary for the listeners on where things are headed in the future with the, with your new, uh, your new role with professional transition strategies. Yeah, yeah. So I just joined uh, Professional Transition Strategies, um, just literally just uh, the this week. Um, <laughs> they're one of the leading um, merger and acquisition and practice transition consultancies in the nation. Uh, they were founded in uh, 2007. They've created uh, more than two billion dollars with B with a B. Two billion dollars in deal flow for their clients. Wow. Um, they, what they do is they are, and what I do now, I'm I'm sell side representation. I'm a fiduciary for uh, the practitioner, um, okay. and for lack of a better term, what we do is we 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 create a uh, for the for the correct practice, um, and we can create. Um, 
for lack of a better term, a bidding war amongst various DSOs and private equity firms for uh, the practitioner's practice. Um, all we do is uh, give them information and let them make the decision. There's never any pressure for them to do anything, but what we can do is put them in a very advantageous position uh, to leverage their largest asset, their practice to create generational wealth for um, uh, for them and their families. Right. Um, uh, the traditional model, um, it was more of if you're looking, you know, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, or even if you can, if in many cases, our average transactee last year was in their early 40s, to give you an idea. So mm, it's not wow. about doctor. It, it's so similar to selling cone beam. Doctors don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, BSO is a four-letter word to a mm -hmm. lot of people, and rightfully so. Um, there are two different kinds of DSOs out there. The ones that we call the activist groups, mm -hmm. those were the ones that have used in a proven business plan, maybe for another industry and then apply it to a new industry. So okay. the, so the activist DSOs are probably what comes to mind when you think DSO, which is they come in and. They're going to buy you out and then you're just going to be an employee. You're just an employee. You're just a number. You're just on a spreadsheet. You think you think spreadsheet over patient care. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and this really started really booming just right before COVID, uh, for maybe just a couple of years before COVID, really right before COVID. Um there were a number of clinically agnostic groups that have arisen. For instance, let's just say that, you know, let's take you right now. Let's say you're still uh, practicing. You've got two or three successful practices and then four or five of your buddies that graduated ortho school with you, that, that you, they have the same and you're mm -hmm. all have a like minded approach patient first, maybe you're all airway orthodontist, whatever the case may be, you're like-minded, you're top-notch practitioners, and you decide, hey, we can scale this. Let's mm -hmm. spread our gospel across the nation. How mm -hmm. do we do that? We get some private equity backing, and we start teaming up with more like-minded practitioners, mm -hmm. and we create our own platform. Wow. Those are the groups that I work with and also work direct with private equity as well. So uh, uh, Professional Transition Strategies, or PTS, um, has actually started many platforms in, in that very way. They get a group of like-minded practitioners, they take them direct to private equity investors, and mm -hmm. they start their own platform. So, And does the doctor maintain the autonomy of the control of their that particular practice? Absolutely. The doctor's name stays on the door. I mean, it, it's a little different for everyone, but yes, we work mm -hmm. with clinically agnostic groups. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, we've blacklisted a lot of groups. Our uh, PTS has tr such tremendous reach. Um, on average, they've you know, they've touched every dental practitioner on the U.S. in some way, email, text, phone call three times. So they right. have tremendous reach uh, in regards to their marketing. So if a pra uh, let's, uh, there are many practitioners that are, you know, in their late 30s, mid 40s that are even interested in this because normally it's a five year plan. OK. When I was an independent consultant, this is part of what changed. I had partnered with multiple different consultancies. So I had a solution for everyone. Mm -hmm. I had a solution if you're 75 year old Dr. Smith and your practice did 300,000 last year and you want to come to me and hand me the keys and head to the beach and say, Ty, sell this for me. I had a solution to that. All the way up to the multi-million dollar practices who want to start a platform or want to partner with a clinically agnostic DSO. Mm -hmm. um, and in the year and a half, I was doing it on my own. Um, actually, by the end of this month, um, would have transacted uh, around $40 million wow. uh, for 
clients. Um, so yeah, I, I had a solution for everyone. Um, what I found was that the firm that I ended up partnering with the most and the firm that consistently uh, delivered the, by far the best results for my clients um, on the larger side was professional transition strategies, PTS. So um, I approached them about becoming a, a full-time uh, practice transition consultant or M&A advisor for them. Um, uh, they took me up on my offer and, uh, and here we are. So, so traditionally, and I won't take too much time, but traditionally, um, let's say that, um, you know, you're looking at, uh, part selling your practice traditionally because of traditionally because of, uh, the, the banks would set a ceiling on what they would loan. So let's yeah. say a million dollar practice. Really, somebody else on average can only get a loan for about eight hundred thousand dollars for that practice. So that makes the market value of your practice about eight hundred thousand dollars. And then you want to stay on for maybe three to five more years in practice uh, percentage of collections. That's mostly for for DPs, but uh, orthodontists, it, it can be a percentage of collections or it can be a per diem. But at any rate, you're staying on, you get about 800,000 and then you get your normal salary after that. Well, okay. um, in the private equity or clinically agnostic DSO space, you can get a premium on that practice because they, they pay on multiples of EBITDA, earnings before income taxes, depreciation and amortization. So just going to use kind of middle of the road multiple as an example here. Um, but you could very easily get, instead of get 800 for your practice, get 1.2 million for your practice. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, and you have a, let's say you have a five-year plan. Okay. So you put that additional 400,000 bonus mm -hmm. uh, that you got back into the group. Okay, it's called holding company equity. Okay. For the last 30 years, uh, ROIC, acronym for return on invested capital, and holding company equity um, is 4.8x dollar on dollar on the withdrawal. So, on average, two numbers to remember in the private equity space number three and number five. On average, Every three years, your equity will approximately uh, 3x every three years, 5x every five years. So let's use the five-year example here. Um, the, the doc still gets the 800000 that he would have gotten just on the open market, but he's got $400,000 uh, equity in this group. Mm -hmm. um, and so on top of everything else, name stays on the door, gets to keep his staff. Um, at the wages they were making or more. Um, in most cases, uh, benefits are are added or mm -hmm. they they stay the same or get better. Um, he gets all the economies of scale of being a, a, with a large practice, uh, you know, a large group. Mm -hmm. So uh, think of it instead of owning 100% of his one practice, he now owns 1% 1 of 100 ortho practices. Mm -hmm. Or, or pedo, or you know, a lot of times the groups are conglomerates. So, um, uh, 500 practices is worth exponentially more than 100. 100 is worth exponentially more than 10. 10 is worth exponentially more than one. So, mm -hmm. it's kind of one plus one equals three concept. Mm -hmm. And we get like minded practitioners that are already successful and bring them together, give them all economies of scale, give this them this whole buffet plan that they can choose to use or not use whatever they want. And then we're going to centralize accounting and HR and really take off the plate all the things the doctor hated about his job. I hate, just like, you know, I'm a lifetime sales guy. I hated doing expense reports. You mm -hmm. know, it, for you guys, it, it would be like, well, I hate doing payroll. I hate running the practice. I just want to practice orthodontics. So mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you're free to practice dentistry, orthodontics, whatever your, you know, your specialty is, and you have much less stress of running the business that's being done for you by a very successful organization. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're all working towards the same goal. 
of a recapitalization event, which normally occurs every three to five years. And when that happens, like I said, that equity is going to grow at that multiple. So let's fast forward five years. The doctor has been working for a fair doctor wage mm -hmm. for that five five years. Um, he also, he got, there's three buckets. There's, there's the cash that you get at close. Mm -hmm. There's uh, your salary moving mm -hmm. forward. And then there's the equity and how it's going to grow. So, um, you know, you're going to get that nice check at the close. You're then going to invest some of it in, in equity in the group. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, that 400000 mm -hmm. in five years is going to be worth on average $2 million. Yeah. In five years, $1.6 million. So in five years, if you look at wealth accumulation, um, you're looking at, you know, uh, 2.8 million, uh, throwing out the salary, but, you know, 2.8 yep, million sure. one side and the old way you're still at your 800,000. That's what a lot of doctors don't realize. It's called equity arbitrage. And it's that's what these groups are doing. That's the recapitalization event occurs when. Uh, a group has, you know, grown maybe from like 20 to 100 locations, and now they're worth exponentially more. So they might have bought all of these practice practices at an X multiple. And, mm -hmm. you know, let's just call it a six multiple on EBITDA, just, just throwing a number out there. But then 100 practices together, you know, if you're Bob's hamburgers just by yourself, but then you're worth much more the very next day if McDonald's comes in and buys you and that because you and it, it, you're worth way more as McDonald's. So, yep. so it's the, it's the one plus one equals three concept. There are also, uh, there's also uh, groups out there doing what's called the joint venture model. And that's a very interesting model. That mm -hmm. is where um, you, they buy a percentage of your practice. So they buy up to, you know, they buy 51% or more of your practice. A mm -hmm. lot of times it's a 60, 40 split. So you still own 40% of the EBITDA of your practice mm -hmm. and get distribution. So if your practice is, you know, up to a million dollars EBITDA a year, um, you would get distributions of $400,000 extra per year on top of your salary. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that recapitalization event occurs, the, um, the, the cash in or payout on that can be even greater. It mm -hmm. can be, to, um, you know, from 10 to 17 X on wow. the e portion and the doctor uh, can then convert a, a lot of that to cash. They normally want you to keep at least 15% back in the group, but it gives these doctors a pretty defined exit strategy mm -hmm. to start planning for now at, that they never had before. Mm. Interesting. It's fascinating. So now I like to joke because a lot of my doctors are my, my, uh, my customers from cone beam. And I said at one time, you know, you trusted me and you, you wrote me a p pretty big check. Well, now we can, I'd love to do the same for you. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. And I mean, that's, uh, I can see why there is a market for that. Um, certainly it was the, the old model. If you just find another doc to come in and <clears throat> train that person, uh, they want your practice. They can afford to buy into your practice. They can afford to pay you a fair value for that practice. And then the hostilities that get built in of, well, as a senior doctor there too much. I mean, we could go on and on of the stories. We've both heard countless numbers of those stories really worked very rarely at this point. It just, it's no longer the way things work. I think a lot of it, again, these younger docs come out with so much debt. Uh, it's just the, the, the cost of everything. For a good practice anymore. They can't, they can't even qualify for the loan. Yeah. Right. It's just not practical anymore. And so this is a really interesting and creative way. And I'm, um, I appreciate you taking the time to explain that. I think it'll be really fun for people to hear about this and start to think about, like you said, we don't know what we don't know. 
And, and, you know, right now that is a very, I, I learned a lot just listening to you say that as far as this new sort of uh, avenue that's out there uh, backed by VC dollars, but really letting the orthodontist have, or whatever dental practitioner have more of the autonomy and control of their practice still with less of the things that we don't like, as you said, I, I think that's, that's really excited. I'm excited for you. I think this is a really neat, neat avenue. Thank you. Yeah, dentistry is in the middle of what we call an equity an equity arbitrage consolidation. Um, it's just the way business is done and has been being done for the last 30 years. Some mm -hmm. prime examples, hospitals consolidated 30 years ago, mm -hmm. pharmacies consolidated 20 years ago, mm -hmm. veterinary and dental. They say the vets, yeah started consolidating about 10 years ago um about 10 years ago there were some before but really started about 10 years ago then the clinically agnostic ones really came started blowing up right before covid but if you look at vets um they're a great example all those other all those other industries including vets have reached are pretty close to what we call equilibrium when 60 to 65 percent of a vertical um, or an industry sector has been consolidated, the private equity money moves to a new vertical and then okay. it, it things a bell curve. So the so the value so what they're uh, the multiples start going back down. So um, we most experts estimate that we're about 30 percent consolidated in dentistry. Um, so we're thinking this is a finite period where we maybe have, you know, three to six years left in which this these the, the dentists can take advantage of this equity arbitrage. After okay. that, the private equity equity will move to a different vertical. For instance, okay. in vet, veterinary is a great example. There's um, there's about. 12,000 vet, uh, veterinarians nationwide must there's approximately 10 times the inventory of dentists or more there's about 120,000 unique NPI numbers about 30,000 more specialists mm -hmm. um so larger inventory of dentists they started consolidating about the same time but veterinary for the most part has consolidated so the veterinarians aren't getting those multiples in general mm -hmm dentists are getting so and um different groups have different theses whatever the plural of thesis is um yeah. uh so you know some of them uh are just judge uh, general practitioner groups other have the thesis of birth to wisdom teeth so they're pediatric dentist orthodontist oral surgeon Mm -hmm. There's a big surge in pedo ortho combo groups right mm -hmm. now. So they're looking to take on pediatric dentist and orthodontist only. There's groups that only go after oral surgeons. There's groups that only go after orthodontists, mm -hmm. which are the ones that probably come to mind, you know, that you're thinking of right now. But there's there's 350 self-identifying DSOs. Okay. Uh, Oh, 81 of those right now are investing in orth orthodontist. Um, there's over wow. 1,500 private equity groups currently investing in dental. And wow. the difference is the private equity group is looking to, um, you know, invest in a number of different practices and then start and then have a platform started, whereas uh, the DSOs you hear about are platforms that have already been started that are looking for individual practitioners. Okay. Fascinating. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that, that's pretty cool stuff. And um, it's, it's a changing industry. It, we, we know on, on a macro sense, and like you said, the economies of scale, uh, what can be done. It, it's clearly the tide is turning. And I think the, like I said, DSOs have been a four letter word because they, they earned that in a lot of ways in the earlier model. Um, but I think now you're seeing this, this evolution towards a new model, as, as you said, these clinically agnostic models and, and, and looking at it as ways to help actually support the practitioner to do all that they love to do and provide the service for their community without some of the responsibility that's bogging them down and be able to consolidate their services and combine their resources. So yeah. And as long as that, yeah, that's great. 
And it's really refreshing for me because I think everyone thinks when something gets corporatized, the quality goes down. And there's really a, 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 a you know, a surge of just, uh, hey, we're spreading our gospel and we're all great practitioners. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, these groups are doing a whole lot of good for the world because they're 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 taking top notch practitioners and putting all their brain power together. I mean, many of the CEOs of these groups are practitioners. Mm -hmm found private equity to back them and now they are the ceo of the group and still practicing mm -hmm. um so yeah it's real it's very exciting stuff and i'll be um it'll be a small part of my lecture at at orthopreneurs coming up as well but i'll be lecturing on uh you know a number of different things um but uh i have a track lecture and a doctor lecture um okay. and the track lecture lecture talks about, uh, I think it was an analogy I coined is, you know, getting the Ferrari out of the garage, as you, as you mentioned, as we talk about combing there. Yeah. That's and, where I got that from, from you. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the other, the, uh, doctor lecture, um, is, uh, uh, Glenn asked me to call it, um, uh, lessons from a professional poker play business lessons from a professional poker player. Um, am I a professional <laughs> poker player? Well, it's very debatable. Poker, <laughs> poker is a hobby of mine. Um, I like to play, you know, mostly on the weekend in my spare time when, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have family obligations, but I like to play in a lot of tournaments and stuff. So he, Glenn, thinks that I'm really good. Um, I don't know if you call me professional, like if you want to make an analogy to golf, um, I would say maybe I'd be at the very bottom of the corn fairy tour. I mean, I think <laughs> something like it, it's, uh, there are uh they have these rankings online for, you know, the amount of times that you cashed in a tournament, uh -huh. which that you know the amount of times that you played in a tournament and placed and made it to where you made money um and they rank like 130,000 in the US this year and currently I think I'm ranked like uh I'm in the top 500 of the 130,000 that are ranked so wow that's impressive well yeah play play on the weekends and uh, you know do okay is it a it's a hobby that make a little money break even make a little money if you can find a hobby that you can sometimes make money at that's a the way i look at it, it's a good ho hobby to have and i get to meet all kinds of interesting people doctors dentists um, that's lawyer, fascinating. And actually the, the most famous poker player of all time doyle brunson mm -hmm, sure he graduated dental school. He was a dentist. Little no, I think I some somewhere I heard that. I wouldn't have recalled it on my own, but now that you say that, I heard that. And started playing poker and never uh, practiced dentistry. You wow. Know? Yeah, he just passed away last. Yeah, as you say, didn't he just pass recently? Uh, but he, his net worth was like something like fifty million dollars. Wow. Off of yeah, he was one of the originals, you know, when the World Series of Poker started getting TV pressed over on. I mean, he was one of the original guys. Yeah, absolutely yeah so that, that's 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 outstanding um really great and exciting and um really happy for you and all your all you're doing and uh you, you deserve it you've helped so many doctors and you're going to continue to do that and it's just it's great and i'm excited for your uh lecture at orthopreneurs i encourage everybody to to go listen to you speak there because you just uh so much to offer your wealth of knowledge and and as i've said before really what separated you always in my mind was your availability your honesty and your desire to help the practitioners succeed and whether we agreed or disagreed it was you always i knew where you were coming from and you always were were honest with me and straightforward with me um and i think that's going to serve you so well in your new venture in, in this arena so i'm really excited for you well, i appreciate that and i'm quite impressed with your new venture as well and it really Thanks. did uh, dig into your podcast the, the other day about cone beam really enjoyed it very informative and I enjoy your passion and your honesty about what you're doing. And, you know, just give me a call anytime you need help. You know, I'll answer the phone.
No, I appreciate that very much. And thanks for taking the time to be on the Doc Podcast and, and share, share your story and help educate our colleagues. You bet. You bet. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Dr. Deloitte. Thanks so much, Ty. Take care, bud. All right. See you. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to CE courses or schedule a private one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. And remember to join the Doc community on Locals for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Locals and search for the Doc community. You can also find Doc on Instagram at, at @theorthocoach. And remember, you have the power to do amazing things.